there any grave that is figuratively defiled on a more regular basis than that of Michael Jackson? The man's body wasn't cold before tabloid snapshots of it were circulating in the press, assiduously cataloging everything from the shape and consistency of his hairpiece, to his vitiligo diagnosis, to every drug in his system when he expired. So he plundered his tomb, of course, thereafter, as the estate repulsively sold the Beatles and Elvis music catalog he fought tooth and claw to never surrender in life. And now, the tabloids are back for a fourth fucking helping. This time, with the aid of a hack filmmaker and two long-discredited dipshits it's in tow. The name? Leaving Neverland. A DROCUMENTARY! Because enlisting thespians to tell you the real truth is always a good sign, just as Birth of a Nation, that alleges everything from child weddings to preteen pooper parties without any of that pesky fact-checking in tow. Now, I made what I believe would be my final word on the Michael Jackson allegations two years previous, on the mistaken assumption that once dispelled, a human being's natural tendency to fact-check and consider the source would forestall any further efforts at disinformation. And folks! I stand fucking corrected. But the spurious allegations did leap from thin fucking air, and as such, we must first unveil the source. In this case, the dual source. Two repeat accusers, both former associates of Michael Jackson's, and both of whom have the credibility of a one-armed sword fighter. The first, and for some baffling reason, widely considered most credible accuser, is one Jimmy Safechuck, who claimed, among other things, that he was abused by Jackson shortly after appearing in the 1988 Pepsi advertisement. Now, tuck that factoid away, because connecting allegations of abuse with massively public incidents that trigger an immediate emotional outcry from the public is sort of kind of recurrent element in all the Michael Jackson allegations, and I personally believe believe is kind of the fucking point. Now, putting aside the Jimmy Safechuck claimed in 2014, when he filed a molestation suit against the Jackson estate that, quote, this should trigger a flood of victims to come forward, and ultimately said flood amounted to literally one other fucking dude with a laundry list of credibility problems, Safechuck's assertions don't carry an ounce of weight for myriad reasons. First and foremost, he was subpoenaed to appear at the 2005 trial and ran for the fucking hills instead. Yet, as will become a familiar tale in the coming rant, upon becoming a father and getting therapy, he had a road to Damascus moment and sued the estate of a dead man for damages. Yet, here's where it gets interesting. If you read the legal briefs, all of which are available to the public, you see Safechuck's approach was to describe the MJ estate as, quote, a school, and therefore liable to all the children within it. An assertion so laughable the judge even called it out by name, but it does raise an even more alarming factor. If MJJ Productions was, as Safechuck alleges, a school, that would make them not merely civically, but criminally liable for the molestation you resoundingly fucking failed to prove. So here's a fucking query. Why didn't you file a criminal case? Whatever the answer, I'm certain it has nothing whatever to do with the fact that filing a criminal case wouldn't get you any goddamn money. Safechuck's allegations go from cockeyed to pear-shaped when it later emerged that they appear to have been copied from a 1997 book laughably entitled Michael Jackson Was My Lover, The Secret Diary of Jordy Chandler, reputed to be assembled from the private documents of Jordan Chandler, the accuser in 1993, and which ludicrously alleged the author possessed a copy of a videotape depicting Jackson having sex with a preteen child. The problem? When pressed in court to provide proof of the author's source, he failed to produce anything at all. No videotape, no diary. Jackson, needless to say, won the lawsuit, and Gutierrez fled to fucking Chile without paying a peso. Fast forward to 2014, Safechuck is now repeating multiple libidinous lies that appear to have been originally culled from the pages of Gutierrez's book. Take page 79. He describes a scene in which Jordan Chandler and another child, Brett Barnes, suffer anal contact from Jackson. But wait! In 1993, during a session with a doctor who examined Jordan Chandler, he stated outright no anal contact of any kind had taken place. To make matters worse, the other child involved in this hallucinatory scenario, Brett Barnes, still defends Jackson to this day. Check his Twitter if you don't believe me. Later, the book describes Jackson presenting a medallion as a kind of man-boy marriage token, one repeated by the ludicrous film that was just screened for the saps at Sundance. In the book, 
He apparently gives this token to Wade Robson and oh, wouldn't you know it? In Safe Chuck's lawsuit, he miraculously mentioned the same medallion, but this time the recipient is himself. Not only is Safe Chuck copying lies, he's copying easily disproven ones from a book that was busted for libel and slander no less. This is the kind of shit Michael Jackson dealt with for 25 fucking years, folks, and you wonder why he's dead. As you might expect, Gimme Safe Cuck's lawsuit was laughed at a court in June of 2017. Yet, as Double Jeopardy precludes his trying for the same trick twice, still yearning for a payday, the Prince of Prevarication decided he'd handily skirt the suit being thrown out by amending it slightly and dovetailing it with another man's case. Wade Robson. Now, this is a name you might actually have heard of. At one time, owing I'm sure absolutely nothing to his longtime association with Michael Jackson, Robson was one of the most in-demand dance choreographers on the pop circuit, the explosion of boy bands and pop princesses in the early 2000s providing ample fodder for the fuckbag, culminating in a sordid episode you may have heard of in the Justin Timberlake single, Cry Me a River which tells the tale of his then-girlfriend Britney Spears boinking a backup dancer behind his back, ending in an inevitable breakup. Now, many have since conflated the figure named in the song as Britney's ex, Kevin Federline, but in truth, it was actually her choreographer, Wade Robson, with whom she appeared at multiple events for their blink and you miss it relationship in 2002. TMZ twattery aside, the boy band Cash had already started to dry up in 2005 when Wade Robson took part in the Michael Jackson molestation case as a witness for the defense. That's right, gang, Wade Robson, the primary source for this sweepingly factual fucking mockumentary, put his hand on a Bible and stated under oath and with zero coercion that Michael Jackson never did Dick to him! Now you tell me, if you've been boinking a kid in the butt for seven years, are you gonna let the same child sashay within 113 miles of the courtroom, much less allow him to potentially incriminate you by subjecting him to cross-examination on the witness stand? Even Wade Robson's own mother said in her 2016 deposition that every time she asked him point blank if he was ever touched by Jackson, he emphatically denied it. Quote, he should have had an Oscar. Are you still friendly with Michael? Yeah, we still talk every couple months, catch up. You, you do, know? really? Yeah. Well, what's he like? What's he like? He's a good guy. He's a good guy? Yeah. Show me where he touched you. <laughs> you never, nothing ever, place he touched you, bro. Nothing ever like that? No, no, no nonsense, no, no shenanigans? No. This is what the film is based on, folks! And so we ride the eternal carousel of incredulity that is Wade Robson. In short, to believe Wade Robson is to believe he is a serial fucking liar. Unless you claim he merely defended the King of Pop in a court of law as a result of a stern brow beating, Robson reiterated as recently as mere months before he alleged abuse to begin with that he was never touched. And he did so without prompting to rolling fucking video cameras. I'm starting on a Cirque du Soleil Michael Jackson show. Um, so it's, you know, the equivalent of uh, the Beatles love show that they have, or the Elvis show, but for Michael. Um, which is, uh, you know, exciting and, and terrifying all at the same time, because it's such a huge uh, responsibility. Uh, but that was why I took it on. You know, Michael was such a huge part of my career and life. We were friends for 20 years before he passed, since I was seven. Um, so it's an opportunity for me to give back a little bit to, to, to his legacy. It's such a big part of his legacy and to, to make sure as much as I can that it's done right and that it really represents uh, his essence. And it's a hell of a thing, but after being involved with a dancing reality show, right around the time it was canceled, and shortly after not only Michael's death, but after the Michael Jackson estate decreed they would not avail themselves of Wade Robson's services in the Michael Jackson One Project with Cirque du Soleil, it's then, and only then, that Robson, reputedly while on a boat, is struck with the same Damascus flashbang Gimme Safe Cut beheld, and he sees the molestation light. But does he level legal accusations immediately? Hell the fuck no! Nah. Like all accusers before him, he first tries his case in the media. Now he's breaking his silence about his claims that Michael Jackson sexually abused him beginning at age seven. Every time we were together, it happened. Um, there was no night that went by that I was with him that he didn't sexually abuse me. Now, did when you testified in 2005, mm -hmm. and you took the stand and you raised your right hand, and you yeah. swore under oath that nothing 
sexual ever happened between you and Michael Jackson. Yeah. Why did you lie? You know, I said what I understood, and I said what I was able to say. Shortly thereafter, Robson approached the estate for an easy payday and was jollied on his fucking way. Cue the lawsuit and resulted media hyperbole. Robson lawsuit expected to trigger avalanche of accusers. Funny, where have I heard that one before? Robson's repressed memory may be key to finally bringing MJ's victims some measure of justice. Which, by the by, is in direct conflict with Robson's own revised allegations. They've been revised a number of times, you see wherein he states that his memory of the molestation was never in fact repressed, but he simply didn't know it was molestation and that it was wrong. A curious assertion given that he sat in on the 2005 trial where they explicitly stated hundreds of times that the conduct of which Michael was fallaciously accused was not only wrong, but illegal. Evidently it takes a decade or two for Robson's thinky-majig to kick the fuck in and process information he was told hundreds of times during the trial he voluntarily testified in. Interestingly enough, this also conflicts with a statement he made during the 2005 trial where he said of actual molestations, quote, I never had that experience and I hope it never happened to anyone else. That sound like someone who doesn't know it's wrong to you? As for the numerous Robson revisions, first, he claimed Michael Jackson told him that if he ever told anyone, they would both go to jail. He says Jackson warned they would both go to jail if anyone found out. So for decades, Robson defended Jackson, saying he never molested anyone. Why he would still believe that bullshit as an adult man in a courtroom in 2005, and more importantly, why he would fail to inform fucking anyone despite being asked multiple times until four fucking years after Michael Jackson's death, remains one of the many nebulous queries his legal team routinely fails to fucking answer. As such, he switched the story up almost immediately, claiming Michael Jackson coached him in an elaborate form of role play over the phone, which he alleged made him a quote, master of deception. On that at least, Wade, we fucking agree. The method of mastery over his hapless juvenile victims, you inquire? Brace for some serious psychoanalysis here. But Michael's entire technique, according to Wade Robson's deposition, was to say over the phone, Hey, they're trying to take our careers away by lying about us and saying we did disgusting sexual stuff. Let's fight them. Click. The Mephistophelian mind of serial molester Michael fucking Jackson, my friends. And he wants us to believe that programming somehow held for two goddamn decades. Never mind that this contradicts with the version he gave the Sundance filmmakers, where he now alleges Michael told him the encounters were, quote, an expression of love. Michael told me that we loved each other and that this was love, that this was a, an expression of our love. Well, which is it, Robbo? Because it seems to me, depending on who you're talking to, Michael's description fucking inverts. Incidentally, Wade Robson's mother proffers still a third version of events, wherein Wade claimed he couldn't handle the shame of admitting the assaults took place, something Wade Robson's own deposition overtly contradicts. When the prosecutor explicitly asked, quote, when you testified at the criminal trial in 2005, did you feel any sense of shame? He replies, quote, No, I didn't. I didn't have any. As I stated, I didn't have any perspective on it. Before extrapolating that, quote, I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know that at any time pre-May 2012. Unquote. Three different versions, and we're not even to the deposition yet. Motherfuckers, the George Lucas of molestation allegations. To say nothing of how utterly batshit Michael would have to be to enlist Wade Robson in his defense, not only in 2005, but as far back as interviews from 1993, when he now alleges he was being actively abused. A second family claiming to be friends with the entertainer was introduced to CNN late Thursday by an associate of Jackson's. Yeah, you know, there's been different times where it'd just be me and Michael. Then there'd be other times where he has other friends over too. This is what, like what Brett said, it's just a slumber party. We just have a lot of fun. And you know, I've slept in the same bed as Michael. It's just you watch cartoons, you fall asleep. You know, it's just a friendship. And I know he would never do anything to hurt my brother. He's just, he's the nicest guy you've ever met. I've been there when uh, the, these kids have been in Michael's room. I've been there with them. It's just party time. They watch videos, they eat junk food, they play video games. Look at all that credible evidence, eh? Good thing HBO doesn't do pesky shit like fact check. And then, in December 2017, Wade Robson, with Jimmy Safechuck in tow, was once again laughed the fuck 
out of court. Now, the rejoinder from the fuckwits at MJ Fax is that only the estate was absolved of responsibility if the molestation indeed occurred, which sounds lovely when you subsist in an ideological fuck bubble publishing character assassination all goddamn day and huffing your own fucking farts in reality land where we don't use e-drama websites as primary fucking sources. The judge was Mitchell Beckloff, a family court judge, and thus more than amenable to a prospective molestation case. If he'd considered the accusations credible, even if he'd then thrown the case out on technicalities anyway, no chance in nine nebulous hells he wouldn't have at least weighed in on the efficacy of their validity. Yet in his final ruling, Beckloff uttered not one mumbling fucking word about it. Really gets the old almonds activated, folks. Anyone with an iota of legal understanding comprehended immediately what these post-mortem accusations truly were. A flagrant attempt to incite an out-of-court settlement from an estate seeking to spare the dead singer's name from beyond the grave, at least one of which was a vengeful retaliatory act for being shut out of profits from the Michael Jackson Cirque du Soleil spectacular. One they sadly had every reason to believe they would get, given that the Michael Jackson estate is represented by the same legal team that pressured Michael to not fight the 1993 charges and settle instead for a sum most normal people would find substantial, but which Michael could make on one portion of one fucking tour. Yet inexplicably, they actually fought this time and won! Something Michael's defense attorney in 2005, Tom Mesereau, feared may not happen at all. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the ironclad credibility of the two primary sources for Leaving Neverland, the new folkumentary being hyperbolically described by the leading tower of journalistic credibility at Jezebel as arresting and horrifying by the hookah-sucking hipsters at Sundance. The response is typical. Can't win it in the courts? Credibility torpedoed like the Lusitania? Fuck it! Try your case in the media. In fact, Robson was reportedly already shopping a book deal as early as late 2012 specifically about the Michael Jackson allegations. Man, he recovered quick! As I said, this is a familiar tactic with those looking for payouts from the King of Pop. The original accuser in 1993, bafflingly believed by most of the public to be the most credible of the allegations, was never actually intended to be a criminal case, as the family privately approached Michael for money, and it was only after they were turned down that they proceeded with a civil suit, despite the DA downright begging them to prosecute criminally. And given the recorded phone call with the father, it's pretty obvious the reason why. This man is going to be humiliated beyond belief. He will not believe it. He will not believe what's going to happen. Beyond his, beyond his worst nightmares, sell one more record. If I go through with this, I win big time. I will get everything I want. They will be destroyed forever. It's right there in white, black, and bullshit. Give me money or get wrecked in the media. Look, this is a repeated pattern with Michael, and as much as MJ fans may not want to admit it, it does stem from a character flaw, just not the horrific allegation of pedophilia. Michael, according to everyone from Corey Feldman to former wife Lisa Marie Presley, had a curious Elvis Presley-esque tendency to freeze you the fuck out if he was displeased with you in any way. If he got uncomfortable or felt vulnerable, he would ice you out as a mechanism. He'd push you away and ice you. It was like a shark sometimes in that way. You could just... It. You know, mm -hmm. you've done him wrong or whatever, so you were out. Now I ask you, what happens when a parent stops responding to a human fucking kid? What happens when they freeze in the fuck out? Do they calmly sit in the corner with their crayons and coloring books? Or do an overwhelming plurality set about kicking up a tantrum to secure your attention and get what they goddamn want? And nothing grabbed Michael's attention like media misinformation. If Michael had one frayed, exposed nerve, the parasites could work like a pommel horse. It was his hatred of tabloid stink pieces. And it's no accident that every accuser thereafter went to the reporters before they went to the popos, sometimes in direct defiance of police advice. And in addendum to the fuckwits who alleged that while well, the 2005 case was flimsy and that's why he got off, that 1993 case was a bottomless wellspring of criminality. Why else would he have settled out of court? Here's a happy little factoid. For all intents and purposes, Michael Jackson was acquitted of both the 2005 and 1993 cases simultaneously. See, since Michael had been persuaded to settle by his lawyers and insurance company to continue his tour in 93, DA Tom Snedden was positively 
possessed. He pushed for the adoption of a statute in California that stipulates that in any case of criminal molestation, evidence of prior acts may be admitted in concert. Meaning even though the family settled in 93, the evidence was still legally allowed in court. And in the case of the mother, she did! The accuser, Jordan Chandler himself, skipped the country to avoid having to appear, mind you, which is also why two bodyguards and a maid that claimed Michael had boinked Macaulay Culkin in 1993 were allowed to testify. Only to be stunned when Macaulay Culkin himself, who had every reason not to show thanks to an early 2000s career revival, decided he'd be one of the very first witnesses for the fucking defense! A defense Culkin has maintained ever since! And what Basically. happened at the house? That's what all these things it's, are people you know, that's, are concerned that's about. That's so weird, you know. What did happen? Nothing happened, you know? Nothing. I mean, nothing, really. I mean, we played video games, you know? We, we you know, played Sleep it as a amusement bed. park. Well, the thing is, the thing is with that whole thing, is that, you know, they go, oh, you slept in the same bedroom as him. It's like, I don't think you understand. Michael Jackson's bedroom is two stories. <laughs> and it has, like, like, three bathrooms and this and that. So when I slept in his bedroom, yeah, but you have to understand the whole scenario. And the thing is with Michael is that he's not very good at explaining himself. And he never really has been. Because he's not a very social person. I mean, he's, you're talking about someone who's been sheltered and sheltering himself also for the last, like, 30 years. Or and he wasn't the only one, with Lisa Marie Presley, who was actively warring with Michael in the press at the time, still defending his heterosexuality, even in the face of a rather tasteless grilling by Howard Stern. Can you even tell us, all right, were you sexually satisfied by Michael Jackson? Well, the answer would be, would I have married someone that I wasn't? But, I mean, it was a real marriage, like, between husband and wife. Yep. It was a consummated mm -hmm. marriage. Yep. It was. Okay, that's all. Yeah, so, in your mind, it was, it was real. To me, yes, it was. This is one of the reasons I break company with many MJ fans when they defame Lisa Marie Presley. In late 99, Lisa had every reason to throw Michael under the bus. And she did in certain ways. But the one subject she never wavered on was that she had a normal, heterosexual, married relationship with the man and never witnessed any molestation. As for Michael's current controversy fueled by the British documentary, that was a train wreck, you know. Lisa Marie says she never saw any inappropriate behavior. If I had seen anything, believe me, his ass would have been hanging from a tree, so... I don't know, I never saw anything like that. Even while actively lobbing verbal hand grenades at the guy in the wake of two nasty breakups, she maintained right up until his death that theirs was a perfectly normal sexual relationship. And in two years of marriage and another five fucking each other under the radar thereafter, she never saw one kid get fiddled with. Oh, and as an aside, after Wade Robson and Jimmy Safechuck had their case kicked down their teeth by an actively sympathetic judge, they combed the countryside for none other than 1993 accuser Jordan Chandler, who reportedly fled the country a fucking gen. Well, there's your open and shut shit show, folks. Thrown out by a judge twice, one of whom testified under oath ten years be fucking four that it never fucking happened, only to change his tune after the tanking of his career. But oh, now that it's in a shitty Sundance flick, it's magically fucking credible. Funny, I once saw a film about a fucking geek in green pajamas that fly through space with a magic superhero ring. Must be a goddamn documentary! And fun fact, it's not even the first film of its type. Noted disinformation foundry BBC4 aired its own Aspie Algonquin in 2011, much of which I already rebutted in my previous video. A fact I forgot to mention, though, it emerged shortly before release that the film's primary source was none other than the same Victor Gutierrez whose book Safechuck's allegations appear to be mimeographed from. Oops! But hey, now the lies are at Sundance, so that magically makes them credible. If you believe this bullshit, you also believe Jenna Jameson doesn't know the taste of penicillin. I'm Razor Fist. Try earning your money like normal people and let the poor man rest. God fucking speed!